It's 12.01 here in Chicago and the Midwest. So Mark G, should we just get this going on? Start our little party? <laughs> so my name is Belinda Chang, if we haven't met, and I have met most of you, and many of you I met here at Virtual Boozy Brunch. So I think that is so cool. And one of the joys, although there are some non-joys of Zoom, <laughs> that's one of the fun ones. But welcome. This is episode 25. We've been doing this for 20 Sleep. spending an hour together on a Sunday to have some connection and some comfort and to try to find some joy and to drink great things, eat great things and learn from these magical experts. And I wanted to try a little experiment today. I was reading this article in the New York Times about being positive during the pandemic and also about judging your productivity. So I'd love for everybody to open up their chats and get involved with us today and just type in something that's positive that happened to you this week or something that you were able to finish. Victoria's good news for today is that she already made her peach pie. <laughs> Morgan's great news is that she scheduled her first haircut since March. I should probably do that too, but we all want to support and connect with you and learn what you're excited about so that we can cheer for you. And we'll call out a few people to share those things throughout the show today. But I also want to share that you can always find the recipes to cook along with us every week on the webpage. It's at BelindaChang.com. And you can also find archives of the special offers that we've offered for the brunchers, people like Kennefick Ranch Winery and Iron Horse Winery all put together fun packages for us. So you can still buy them if you click through and find them. So definitely click through all the pictures and images. And if you take pictures of your finished pies today or your beautiful swizzle drinks, we would love for you to post them and hashtag them virtual boozy brunch so that we can share them in the highlights forever and also share your achievement and magic with everyone. Okay, so here's the super fun thing about today. Well, there are a lot of fun things, but Morgan Olson, who I mentioned, has been with us since the very beginning when this virtual boozy brunch thing was just an inkling in my mind, it was a few days later that we started, is my co-host today. So we're gonna hear from her in just a minute, but she is a beautiful, smart, talented, successful and fabulous woman who is the global food and drink lead for Time Out and also is the editor for Time Out here in Chicago. And I just love her, so we get, more of her magic now moving forward and i'm so excited she's here what else am i supposed to talk about i think that's about it i think now we spotlight you morgan <laughs> and you start your first co-host gig at virtual boozy brunch and i think we do have to unmute you unmute yourself girl all right i think i'm <laughs> unmuted now Thank you so much for having me, Belinda. I am so stoked to be here. Like Belinda mentioned, I've been tuning in since day one and have had so much fun in this community. And I can't believe we are at episode 25. It feels like it's been five years, but also five months. What is time anymore anyways? <laughs> um, so I wanted to take everyone through three things that will make this brunch as fun and supportive and fabulous as humanly possible. My regular brunchers know this stuff, so bear with me. Um, the first thing that we're going to want to pay attention to is the chat box, which Belinda just mentioned. It's right down here somewhere. It says <laughs> chat on it. Open it up. That is the best way to communicate with all of our beautiful brunchers during the next hour. It's also a great way to kind of virtually raise your hand and ask any of our guests questions along the way. We really want to get the conversation going in there. So feel free to just start dropping your good news of the week and then just comment along. Even if it's, damn, that swizzle looks amazing. We want to hear it. <laughs> and then second is that we've got two ways to view on Zoom. So right up here somewhere, you're going to see two different ways that you can view virtual boozy brunch. So the first is called Spotlight, and that will focus in on the speaker or bruncher who is talking. And the second way to view is gallery mode, which is 
my favorite way to experience virtual virtual boozy brunch because you can see everybody's faces see who's mixing along baking along laughing along or maybe just drinking but do keep in mind that we can see you if your camera is on so don't be too naughty with whatever <laughs> you're doing at home today um and last but certainly not least Thank you so much for joining us for episode 25, which feels so epic. I know that during this time, especially over a holiday weekend, it is so tempting to go outside and get back to life as normal. But as we all know, this is the safest way to connect with the culinary community at this moment. And we are so grateful for this beautiful place to kind of join every Sunday. So that is it for me and over to you, Belinda. Okay, so we just wanted to give thanks to all of our amazing talent that spent the hour sharing their magic with us last week. If you tuned in a little earlier, Megan checked in and I already see her scurrying around making a bar <laughs> over at Jenny's place, which is so great. She was our guest co-host last week, Dr. Megan Appleman. We also had some beautiful cakes that Morgan and a few of us were able to decorate from Flavor Supreme. Uh, and we had my cousin, Henry Chow, a world renowned hospital designer and architect who's made some amazing gorgeous hospitality oriented hospital spaces and then also Donovan Mitchell who made a pina colada I don't know how I've never made one before but his recipe is great and it's still up on our web page and you can find him at money gun or you can buy cocktails made by him for money gun to be delivered and then Morgan I'm gonna let you tell about what we're doing today and for this week Yes, so this week's theme is tart. And as a journalist, I truly love this because the word tart has so many different meanings and there are so many different facets of this word that we're going to explore over the next hour. So for me personally, when I think of tart, my mind immediately goes to the pastry, of course, because I'm always thinking about food. Um, and, and it's a pastry that's characterized by an open top and it is truly the best vehicle for showcasing seasonal produce, whether you're working with peaches or cherries, asparagus, we'll talk more about it in a second. Um, of course, the word tart is also used to describe a core taste that's sharp, sometimes sour, acidic, tangy. Um, so we're gonna be exploring that asset of tart through two beautiful cocktails today. And finally, perhaps my favorite use of the word, uh, tart has been used for centuries to describe women. And I'd like to think that over the last couple of decades, the word has kind of been reclaimed to really describe independent badass ladies. And we are so fortunate to have a couple of total badasses that we're gonna spotlight later in the segment. Um, so I'm gonna throw it back over to Belinda, who's going to tell you exactly who we're meeting and showcasing today. Yay. So we have three guests, some tarts, if you will. I think it's a great thing. I want to be called a tart. I don't know about you, Morgan, but like I've got my best tart outfit on <laughs> and the whole thing. So we're going to do a drink today. We're making some swizzles. So get your rums ready and whatever you're going to use to swizzle the drink. This is a cocktail with one of my favorite tools in all of cocktail dumb. We're also going to be baking tarts sweet and savory so rolling out some dough and getting some amazing expert advice on the tarts that you're going to make at home today or later and we have a super cool project from a great tart amy boyle called 52 extraordinary women that we're going to talk about and share and also talk about three of the women that she profiled for this project who i think are also glorious tarts so without any further ado I don't know about you, but I definitely want to get something into my glass and get this brunch going. So Morgan, tell us who we have as our magical, can we call you a tart too, Garrett? I mean, would you be offended? <laughs> We're going to go for it. <laughs> so Morgan's going to tell us about Garrett Richard. I am so excited to introduce Garrett Richard, who is truly a world-renowned mix master and has worked in some of the best bars in New York City. Um, and his resume includes spots like 
Monkey Bar, Rain's Law Room, ZZ's Clan Bar, and most recently, Existing Conditions. And Garrett has always been a huge fan of tiki cocktails, and Punch has even called him the torchbearer of the next generation of tiki files. And I don't know about you guys, but I am ready to get a drink in my system. And I'm going to hand it over to Garrett, who is going to take us through two cocktail recipes step by step for everybody following along at home. Garrett, are you ready for us? Oh yeah, I'm ready. Although I need I need the two of you to rewrite my resume at some point because that was uh, I couldn't pay for a better one. <laughs> All that we're we're available for you know hype master type roles. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I think every good bar program needs a hype man. You know, flavor flavor, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we're doing swizzles. And the biggest thing is, what is a swizzle, right? Um, you may have seen one at your favorite cocktail bar. Maybe it had mints, maybe it had bitters, definitely a lot of ice. But I think the best way to think about swizzles is it's kind of an individual punch. It's a punch for one. It's one that you make for yourself. So you can make it as tart or as sweet as you want. Um, we're going to do a really cool swizzle that's sort of a little under the radar, so every one of you at home can have a secret recipe that maybe not even the cocktail bars know about. This is a Martinique swizzle from 1946 from the Lost Trader Vic's Book of Food and Drink. Um, swizzles are great for home bartenders because you can build them in the glass. You don't need a fancy shaker. You don't even need necessarily the swizzle stick, which Belinda was talking about, which is a really cool device to make the cocktail. This is traditional in the islands, but you could use a milk frother. You could use a long spoon. You could use an iced tea spoon. You could use your finger if it's long enough and it can take the colds. You know, it's really, it's about building the cocktail in the glass, a baby punch, if you will, over crushed ice, which we're going to do that. Uh, starting with basically some cocktail seasoning. Um, I tell everyone this that comes into existing conditions and everyone that wants to make cocktails at home, the first thing you should do to start a cocktail is use salt. Salt is at the tip of your tongue and it combines basically the sweet and savory parts of your taste receptors. And if you leave it out, you start to really miss it once you start using salt in cocktails. Behind the bar, we tend to use salt water, which is basically, this is four parts salt to one part water, or 80 grams of, of water to 20 grams of salt. Um, if you don't have salt solution at home, you can just do a pinch of salt. Uh, your hands won't be as wet as mine behind the bar. But basically, we're gonna just do a pinch of salt or five drops of a saline solution. And then the bitters, are also kind of like the seasoning of the cocktail. This is very integral to Caribbean flavors. You get cinnamon, allspice, nutmeg. So we're gonna do like a healthy three dashes of bitters. Swizzles are supposed to have like a really good spice component to them. So you're gonna wanna you're gonna you're gonna wanna do a liberal liberal three dashes of bitters. And then this kind of ties into how Martinique is a French speaking island. We're gonna season with a little bit of absinthe. Now Absents come in a lot of different varieties, a lot of different types. Um, I love St. George because it has a real earthy flavor to it. Um, it's also made with brandy, so it goes really well with the rum. But just make sure you have an absent that you like the quality of and that's not on the sweeter side. There are some that have sugar or that are a little bit uh, more on the liqueur end of flavor. You want one that's really bright and aromatic because we're not actually going to use a lot. We're only going to use a half teaspoon. Garrett, can I ask you, you mm -hmm. called for a swizzle glass in the recipe. What is a swizzle glass? Yeah, um, basically with any sort of like tiki or tropical drinks, I think because they're on crushed ice, you really, the biggest thing to care about is actually the volume of it. So basically you just want something like, this is a traditional one that would be used at a place like Don the Beachcomber, the Mai Tai, and it's actually metal which conducts the cold better. But if you don't have a glass like this, like a, an aluminum tumbler, you can definitely just use a Collins glass or even a Pilsner glass if you have like those 
lying around if you're a beer drinker. Um, but basically, you want something in the 10 ounce to like 12 and a ounce, uh, 12 and a half ounce range for for volume. But, cool. but yeah, Swizzle glasses. These these ones are uh, this one's actually made by Cocktail Kingdom, and they were defunct for a long time. But if you look at like lots of like 50s liquor ads, it's a lot of people drinking out of like aluminum tumblers you know, what have you. It's probably because it was the space age polymer of its time, but uh, so, all right. So, so far we have saline, some bitters and some absinthe. So our glass is seasoned. This is the, this is the spices we're using. Um, and then we got to do the tart factor. It's the tart episode. So we need fresh lime juice. Um, I recommend with lime juice to actually use a fine strainer. If you're doing a really simple drink, I think it's okay to have lime pulp in there. But I found over the years um, that if I'm working at a bar that doesn't strain their lime juice and it's super pulpy, it tends to be like the more ingredients a drink is, the less you taste them. You're just tasting lime pulp. So if you have a tea strainer, if you have uh, even a strainer you use for coffee, it's definitely gonna work. And then we're just gonna use a regular citrus press for this. I like to use kind of both in one hand, so I don't I don't even have to take the time to strain it. It's already just coming out and going right through the strainer. So we're going to do three quarters of an ounce of lime juice. So that's basically going to be like most of this lime. Depends where you're getting your limes right now, but right now they're not they're not that dry, so I'm able to get all the lime juice I needed. I'm looking at the cocktail army over here. <laughs> Yes. And Garrett, if we have just regular ice cubes, like these guys that come out of the freezer, um, do you have any tips for crushing these up or can we just use these to build the cocktail? Depending on how big they are, and we'll definitely get to that, um, you can just crack it with a, get a really nice spoon, one that's like got some heft to it and just crack it in your hand and then uh, throw it in there. That'll be like a little more rustic, but definitely will work. All right, so we got a mallet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have the all. Yeah, or mall mallet would definitely work. You know, I'm ready. Um, I've got the gear. So yeah, we have three quarters of an ounce of lime, and then we're going to balance that out with uh, an equal amount of cane syrup. So cane syrup is really common in Martinique. You see it in all the hotel bars. Um, it's just basically evaporated cane juice that is dissolved into sugar. If you don't have fancy Martinique cane juice, all you need to do is make a simple syrup that is two parts sugar to one part water. And huge mistake that even cocktail bars make is if you have a scale at home, weigh your syrups. It is way more accurate and, than just using a measuring cup and it'll make your cocktails just that much crisper and that much more uh, delicious. So this is gonna be three quarters of an ounce of our rich cane syrup. So Garrett, so so technically then to make a better cocktail, you should weigh everything or just the syrup? Just, just the syrups, because okay. what you want is you want either a one-to-one, -one, which means it's half, like basically half water, half sugar, or you want two parts sugar to, to one part water. And sugar weighs differently than water, and you want to make sure that those are by volume, they sit differently. So you want to make sure that they're actually an equal weight of each other. That way you get like the, the right uh, sweetness in a cocktail. Cool. All right, and then we're gonna go on to the rums. Um, this is gonna be the star of the show, but before we get to the star, we're gonna do the supporting, the supporting actor, the Steve Buscemi circa early 2000s. Um, so this is a 151 Demerara rum from Guiana and if you've only had like the party juice from college, like the jungle juice 151, this is a whole different animal. Um, 151 rum from the Demerara Valley is super smoky, very gunpowdery, and it kind of brings that like pirate factor to cocktails. And this is gonna just give us a lot of molasses that we like. And I tell, uh, I tell people in seminars this all the time, uh, when you're blending rums, it's a lot about contrast. So this is just going to contrast the next rum coming up. This is going to be a half ounce of a Demerara 151 rum. And if you don't have a sort of smoky 151, 
you can definitely just use like a richer rum to contrast the star, which is going to be a bright, grassy rum from Martinique, hence the Martinique swizzle, right? Um, and if anyone doesn't know, Martinique makes rum agricole, which is different from most rum. It's made with pressed sugarcane juice rather than molasses. And so it's a much more vegetal product. And um, if no one's ever, if you've never had it before, it's like, it's a lot closer to tequila or even Pisco because it's very bright and sunny. So we're gonna do one ounce of a white Martinique rum. And uh, Martinique rum tends to come in a lot of different proofs. So just be careful how strong it is. <laughs> All right, so we have everything in the glass now and now we get to swizzle. Basically starting off, all you want to do is chill the drink down. You don't really want to fill the glass with a bunch of ice. And so I tell people just fill it halfway, trying to air it. This is not the final presentation because a lot of this is going to melt because you have alcohol in there. So I'm going to use the swizzle stick. And with sizzling, you're just moving your hand back and forth. You're trying to aerate the drink. You're trying to chill it down. Think about like stirring, you know, stirring soup, what have you. And if you can see, all of those ingredients have a lot of air in them now. And you can even smell, they're starting to open up and they're starting to like really bring all the characters and the ingredients. So now that this has kind of started to chill and you can see on the side of the glass, we're gonna to need to top up with a little bit more ice because that 151 is not going to dilute itself. <laughs> and then as you top up, you can sort of start to chill it down even more, kind of like a mint julep, dirty day yesterday. Um, showing you another way to do this with a, just a bar spoon and going up and down, up and down. So beautiful. Garrett, and also, Morgan, Morgan, we have another question for you. Zach, I'm gonna unmute you. Will you ask it? Oh, sure, yeah. I was just asking, I think the, the you know, I have a screaming child in the background. <laughs> I was, he has not yet had his booze. Uh, I was gonna ask if, um, you know, uh, Rome Agricole, I haven't tried very many of them, but but from what, uh, Gary, what you were saying, it strikes me as being more like something like cachaca than necessarily other rums. Is that is that a good way to think about it? Yeah, that's really good. If you've had cachaca before, they're kind of, uh, they're kind of cousins. Um, they're both made sort of in similar styles, but then once, once it hits the still, they're very different. Um, Rome Agricole uh, tends to be distilled a little bit higher so okay. it tends to be a little more in your face and cachaca usually is a little bit lower in proof so it's uh it's a little more mellow but yeah it's kind of uh it's kind of like two uh two guitar players playing the same song just you know you're gonna get a little difference but they're you know there's there's that uh similarity together but if i so if i had cachaca at home you would recommend using that in this drink instead of like a, a typical silver rum oh that would totally work yeah okay. um Depending if your cachaca is like maybe 40%, you may want to do like an ounce and a quarter to bump it up just a little bit. But yeah, no, cachaca would work beautifully in this cocktail. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Garrett, amazing, Garrett. Well, take us through how we should garnish this one before. Yeah, no, I mean, you can't just, it, it can't just be blank like this, right? Oh. Um, so I would top up with uh, a little bit of ice on the top just to make it nice and pretty. This is the type of drink where, because you built it in a glass, you do actually want a lot of ice uh, just so that it sort of melts down and opens up. But now that you have this like really nice dome on top, uh, a really great way to get your nose in the game is to put some spices on top. Um, this also helps you avoid to have to make a million different spiced syrups at home, is if you have really nice fresh spices, you can actually just grate them on top and have one simple syrup rather than making a clove syrup or an allspice syrup. So speaking of spices, let's do this. Um, let's do a little bit of nutmeg first and try to do fresh grated nutmeg 
nutmeg that is in a container is pretty dead to begin with. And this nutmeg is also gonna help dry the drink out. So the fresher, the better. And then a little bit of grated cinnamon. This is cinnamon bark, which comes from Indonesia. This actually has more cinnamon oil than the cinnamon sticks you just get at the store. And I definitely recommend if you love cinnamon, check out like either Indonesian or Vietnamese cinnamon. So we're gonna do a little bit of cinnamon on the top as well. Oh my gosh, it smells so good. Mm. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's coming at you like five feet away. And then um, another nice little touch is if you want to garnish with like a fun lime wheel, you can take a channel knife and you can actually just make some slits down the side. So fun. Kind of like a basketball, you know? Yeah. And, and the functionality of this, besides it looking pretty once we cut it, is because there's already these divots in it, the lime wheel is gonna bring out more oils than just like a normal lime wheel you would get, you know, in a margarita or something, because it's already cut that way. So as you can see, you got like a little, almost like a, you know, starfish or something. And then because the lime wheel is a blank canvas, you can start to put more spices on it. And uh, so as Garrett is finishing- so we can it with some cloves. Dressing up this cocktail, I do want to remind everyone to open up your Venmo app and send this bartender a tip. It is Garrett with two R's, one T, dash Richard on Venmo. Um, and Garrett, we're running out of time, but we'll just breeze through this second yeah, cocktail. Yeah, we're, we're, we're basically done. And then okay. if you have the cinnamon stick left over, Instead of getting some like plastic swizzle stick, why don't you use something natural, also sustainable, and one that actually has some flavor. So before I put in the drink, I'm actually just gonna do this because then it'll start to bring the oils out. But look at that. You got a cinnamon stick swizzle. And cheers everybody, happy brunch. Cheers. <laughs> oh my gosh, this drink smells so good. Mmm. Mm -mm -mm. And I saw a lot of people having fun swizzling out there. And of course, we need to see Caho's garnish. Kah oh, wow, <laughs> look at that. Garrett, what do totally. you think? Do you approve? <laughs> oh, yeah, I've seen, I've seen some of the garnishes that uh, Kaho's done online. <laughs> Definitely can take me to town. <laughs> this drink is so delicious. I think what we're going to do, Morgan, if it's okay with you and Garrett, um, let's do the punch at the very end and get to rolling and then that way we have a little drink for now and then we can do the second drink a little later. Does that sound good everyone? Amazing. Okay. Uh, all right. Garrett, that was incredible. This drink recipe is super fantastic. I could sit and listen to you talk about rums and tiki forever, but we do have other things to take care of today. And now that my thirst is quenched a bit, I'm ready to take care of my palate and my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the information about Garrett. You can also find him on Instagram and he'll be with us a little later to do the second cocktail. So we're now gonna turn our attentions to the tart that we bake and that we eat. And I have the pleasure of introducing someone I met many years ago and I've always been so impressed with Stephanie Locke. And she put together a collaboration with Mick Klug, who's an infamous peach, apple, berry farmer here in the Midwest. And it's a farm to pie kit. And a bunch of us have it. And a bunch of us also got our own dough together so that we can make a tart with a global tart expert. Stephanie, what are we gonna do with this dough? What are we gonna make with you today? Tell us everything. It's endless what you can do with this dough, but today we're going to start with the building blocks of building a fruit-filled or even a savory uh, vegetable-filled tart. Um, so thank you, first of all, for having me and including us, Abby and myself, with our Farm to Pie kit, which was a uh, pandemic uh, business launch. Uh, that we are really excited about. Abby Klug and I have long been partners 
fruit and pie when my business was the pie business. The majority of my fruit came from her father, Mick Klug. Abby eventually bought the farm and has taken over. And uh, we are just tickled pink to finally have this epiphany that we could finally work together by creating Farm to Pie Kit. And Farm to Pie Kit is her beautiful fruit paired with my delicious, flaky, handmade, buttery dough a recipe from me. Some of them are exclusive to Farm to Pie Kit, have never been released. And they give you the tools to get to pie very simply and easily and beautifully with a beautiful outcome. Um, so you can order those online uh, directly from my website. It will take you right to Farm Kit, uh, farmtopiekit.com. You can go to Abby's website as well. Um, but today I'm doing an apple tart, which is on the packaging of the sweet dough. So this is the dough, ready to roll dough. And on the back of each package are instructions for what's illustrated on the front. And then don't miss on the underside of each sleeve is your recipe. So, so you also, Stephanie, you have tons of recipes on your website, the ready to roll dough website. I mean, it's a treasure trove and it made my mouth water as I was going through it. It looks incredible. Thank you, thank you. So to start, um, you'll want to have defrosted your disc of dough. Ready to roll dough, as I said, is handcrafted. It's also frozen so that you can keep it in your freezer until you're ready to use it. You'd like to uh, lay that on a refrigerator shelf. I usually do it before I go to bed. So the next morning I know I'm ready to roll. So take your disc, yep, out of your box. And I'm gonna move over here to my workspace. Yes. Is this piece of paper first, is it just pretty or can we use it for something too? Is that like parchment paper? No, it's just pretty. <laughs> I just don't know when to stop, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so go ahead and unwrap your dough. But I hold on to this plastic um, piece here. We'll use that here in a moment. And really what I'd like to do is just walk you through the steps of rolling out your dough and assembling a filling. And once you have this down, this is again the building blocks for building these pies that you'll find the recipes for on my website and that accompany the dough. So start with your flour. This is just regular um, AP all-purpose flour. And you're going to want to have a nice clean work surface. And you simply want to throw the dough across your counter because you're not trying to get to some really heavy flour. We're not adding flour to the dough. We're not trying to do anything other than to create almost like a nylon across your skin on the dough. And I should probably take my ring off, right? No jewelry yes. or rolling yeah. dough. Okay. Jewelry, um, short nails are, are preferred. Um, you know, you want to be hands-free, wrist-free as well, no bracelets. You want to be ready to roll. You want to get into this. So take more flour and then do the same action across the top of the dough. I flip it and I do the bottom of the dough. And then I take the dough off to the side and I just give it a tap to release any excess flour. And then set the dough back on your countertop. Then you're going to grab a rolling pin. This is my preferred rolling pin for pies. This is a French style pin with a tapered edge. And this is preferred for me because I really feel like I can uh, have a sense of what's happening when I roll the dough. With a ball bearing American pin, you could just roll and roll and roll and never know where you are necessarily. The dough can kind of get away from you um, without the clue that maybe you should have stopped a while ago. Another very crucial um, tool is your bench scraper and I'll demonstrate this in a minute. So now that your dough is prepared, you've got your rolling pin, you want to add some flour to that and then just start in the center of the disc and start with your hands closer together and just give it a couple of rocking motions out and then turn it a quarter of a turn and then do the same. This will give you um, a sense of how cold the dough is, how warm the dough is. If it's starting to roll out easily, you're in great shape. If it's too cold, you could let it rest for a few more minutes on your counter to become 
um, more room temperature. You don't want it room temperature, but to take some of the chill off. If it's really cold and you just need to go, you could beat the dough, turning it so that it remains round. But this will warm the dough up gently and start spreading the dough so then you can go back to the action of rolling it out. So now that we know that- I really, I really like the beating the dough technique. You know, you've got some pent up aggressions for some stress. That's awesome. So I should always have my dough very cold. Yes, yeah. Yeah, you would be both. <laughs> okay. So going back, just go back to the center. Now I know that this dough is just at the exact temperature that I want. So this is good though. I don't want to wait too long and I don't want to be too slow. So I'm going to go. So again, the same action, coming back to the center of the disc with my pin and rolling out and turning a quarter of a turn. And these turns are important because they keep the dough uniform in a round shape, but it also tells you if you're starting to stick to your counter. Now, I'm not at this point, but let's just pretend that I was. I would take my bench scraper and I would use it rather than trying to pull the dough back or pull it, I would use the bench scraper. And let's say it's sticking right here. I would start behind it and I would pre it with the bench scraper. But I'm also going to assume that maybe it's sticking in other places. So just for the sake of argument, go all the way around. Remove the disc. Chances are the butter is worked into your counter. Go ahead, clear your counter off again, and then just reflower. Her whole counter is a cutting board, I'm so jealous. And bring it back. Okay, so now that we're we're rolling, we know the dough's not sticking. You're stroking. Me, I am super jealous that your countertop is an entire cutting board. I'm having a little, I'm a little envious right now. Also, how, how thin are we rolling the dough? Well, I usually um, suggest, and it's in the, the instructions, that you go to 12 to 14 inches in diameter, which is gonna take you to the right thinness. Um, I'd say it's about a little over an eighth of an inch. I would recommend if you're using more liquidy um, fillings, like if you're doing a quiche or if you are doing um, like a cherry pie or something that's likely to give off more liquid, I'd stick with the 12 inch because you want that, um, you want the dough to be just a little heavier to take on the potential liquid. I think, Stephanie, you already changed my life because when I roll dough and it always ends up square and also lumpy, I never um, knew to just roll from the center and out. I think yeah. I always rolled back and forth and then twisted it. So this is the first piece of pie dough that ever looked right. <laughs> you do this action as well, where they flip it and flour it and flip it and flour it. All you're doing at that point is continuing to warm the dough up too much and you're potentially going to tear it, and it's just totally unnecessary. Right. This method um, lets you know where you are. All your senses are involved, you're engaged, you know that it's moving, you're keeping it relatively round. And listen, it doesn't have to be perfectly round. Um, it's just trying to keep it in its general shape. So I'm just about where I want to be here, and we could measure it, but um, I've done enough to know I think I'm where I want to be. Now that the dough, a good way to feel if the dough is where you want it, you can gently, and you don't want to do this a lot because your hands are heat, and the whole purpose of creating this beautiful dough is to keep your hands off of it so you have those layers and you're not melting the butter. But you can go across it and you can feel high spots if there are any. In this case, I've got a little one here, so I'll just roll that a little bit more. Now, we're going to do a fold over method, which I call a rustic tart. It's also known as a galette. Um, so I like to roll out the outer third of the dough slightly thinner than the rest because you think of the folding action and you don't want a really heavy doughy um, bite. So just go around, get that rim, if you will, roll it out ever so slightly more than the rest. And now we're ready to transfer this into a pie plate. 
I can feel that it's free, so I'm not gonna have an issue peeling it back and leaving the dough behind. And my method for this is to simply fold the front back to the back, grab my pie plate, put it directly in front of the dough, and then I scoop it up like a little baby in a bathtub, pick it up and gently set it into half of the pie plate. Then take that edge. Do we need to grease or, or do anything to the pie pan? You don't have to, but if you're at all concerned about things sticking, um, I would. I would I would just butter it a little bit. And I've started doing that with quiches. Um, and definitely if you used a French um, French style tin mm. included edges, I would definitely butter all of this before uh, I even got started rolling and then transfer the dough into here. And that way you're, it's not a, a complete insurance policy, but you're more than likely to have a really nice release. Great. From and also, um, Alessandra, she's not on video um, and she's muted, but she wanted to know if you're ever going to distribute the ready to roll dough in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Well, I'm trying. And if Alessandra would like to march into her Whole Foods and tell her grocery buyer <laughs> for her store and that she demands that they bring it in um that would be great <laughs> because she they can get it it's been approved for whole foods so she's she's ready to roll if we can get it there stephanie i want to blind bake mine i'm making a savory tart can i bake it in my cast iron uh i think I do it in a pie tin i think you don't have an edge and that might be um it works against you gotcha I, I would probably not do that. I would do a fold over method in that vessel. Thank you. Okay, so now I got the, the dough in the pie plate. I'm gonna take that plastic wrap that the dough was wrapped in when you unwrapped it, and I'm simply gonna lay it on top, and I'm gonna put this back in my refrigerator, and I'm gonna let it rest for another um, 30 minutes, and now I'm going to make the filling. So don't leave the dough on the counter. Don't make the filling and then roll the dough. The dough needs to rest. The gluten needs to calm down. The butter needs to chill. You just want everything to get back to where it belongs so you have a successful pie. So I'm gonna pop this in the fridge. So the sake of like us really wanting to bake a tart with you today, if we don't let it rest in the refrigerator, is it gonna be disastrous? It's not gonna be disastrous at okay, all. Okay, good. <laughs> this again you can break this down into steps and I think we've all learned I remember when I was little watching my mother making pies and to me it just seemed like this full-on non-stop wow. event and the reality is is you can break it down into steps over um, the day or a few days so that it's not just this on you know this race to the finish line so to speak so now I already rolled one out, it's ready to go. And I'm gonna fill it. So this is just going off the recipe that's on the packaging. This recipe is also on my website. So we've got our apples sliced. I like to keep them kind of rustic and um, I like to leave some peel on because that's um, pectin, it's beautiful, it adds texture. And these aren't fussy pies, these are meant to be rustic. Hence the name of my company, Rustic Tart. Here I have the dry ingredients, plus the apples with a little lemon juice. This is sugar, flour, cinnamon, nutmeg, um, a little salt. Just dump that in. Take your spatula, pop it together. Now, if we weren't live right now, I'd let this sit for just a couple of minutes to let everything start to um, play together. But since we want to keep moving, give this a nice toss. And then I'm going to add this to my pie plate and the prepared dough. Oh my gosh, those peaches look so good and the apples look so good. I see so many beautiful tarts and pies happening here. <laughs> When you do this, I like to mound the fruit to the center 
And with edges like an apple or a peach or you know something that has a, a sharp edge, you're gonna wanna just double check that those edges aren't gonna pierce through your dough when we fold it. And do not leave behind the ingredients in your bowl. That's the science, that's flavor, that's, it's really important. And a lot of people just end up leaving a lot behind and tossing it. So now that I've transferred this, you can see I have some pointy um, outliers. So I'm just gonna tidy up here just a bit. Again, you don't have to be nuts about this, but you don't wanna go to all this um, beautiful work only to pierce your dough. And then I'm gonna take some butter. This is a tablespoon of butter cubed and just drop it around. And it's a little soft. I keep this really cold as well. Um, but again, for our purposes, we're going. And then we're gonna do the folding. And this is really simple because the folds pretty much just tell you where they wanna go. So I start in one spot and I just help it along. Now it's just gonna naturally find its next fold. And then again, I just help it along by guiding it. And it really just kind of falls into place. It really doesn't need much of your help. Um, and as you're doing it, I'm seeing some potential edges that might poke through. So I'm just repositioning those. And then you just keep going and give it a nice little press into place. You don't have to be firm or, or um, you know, really vicious about it. Just be gentle. And there you go. That's the fold. It's now, so I like to fold the lily a little bit. And I love texture. I'm a very textural eater. So I like to do um, cream around the edges. And this isn't really because I want the cream. This is the glue for the coarse sugar I'm going to sprinkle on here at the end and that gives it a little sparkle it also adds more texture so you have the texture of the sugar you have the flakiness and crispness of the dough of course you have your texture of your apples or whatever fruit you're using so just go around and then take your coarse sugar i keep mine in a shaker and then i act like my i have a lazy susan and just go round and round and round and round. I even go through the center. And that is how you build an apple tart. Or wow. you know, that's how you build a world-class apple tart. Amazing. That's for kicks and giggles. Yay! <laughs> Here's your uh, end result. I don't know what camera to go into. Like the one you're looking at right now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, you know, your end product. Um, this will go in a preheated 375 degree oven for about 50 to 60 minutes. Every pie is different. You must keep an eye on it and determine when the pie has achieved its perfectness. Um, I tend to, there are a couple of things that I look for. I'll put the pie in the oven and if I have a convection oven or if you have a convection oven, I recommend using it for the first 20 minutes of the bake. After that 20 minutes, turn the convection on. If you don't have convection oven, don't sweat it. It's perfectly fine. After 30 minutes, I will take my pie, which is in my oven. I pull out the rack and I simply rotate it one half turn. So the front goes to the back, back to the front. This is to ensure that you are um, cooking it evenly, that there are any hot spots in your oven, um, and you're getting a nice, even brownie. Then I'll set my timer again for about 20 minutes, and then I'll take a peek. And what you're looking for is the juices in the, in the center of your pie to have a really nice, lovely, wavy, I call it a heartbeat. It's kind of a bump, bump. You don't want volcanic and you don't want just a flat line. You want a little activity. And that's when I know that the pie is done. I tend to like to take them pretty dark um, because the crust just becomes more caramelized and there's more flavor. And again, texture, texture, texture. Um, so you do you, but that would be my method 
and recommendations for making a rustic tart with red Oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> I think you're changing all of our lives. I wanted Victoria to show her tart since she made it earlier this morning. So it was super easy, right, Victoria? <laughs> yeah, it went by really fast and it was delicious. I've already had two pieces. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Well, I know that there's a bunch of tarts going in, so we hope that everyone's Oh there. my God. Yeah. <laughs> I hope people were shared pictures of theirs after they come out of the oven. And I could listen to you, Stephanie, all day too. This is so fun. And thanks for oh, the up everyone's game. Yeah. I mentioned there are how-to videos on readytorolljoe.com. So you can go back and review all this plus much, much more. And I hope that you find the website and Ready to Roll Joe is your go-to and a place where you can learn and continue to grow in your pie making. So thank you for having me. So amazing. Thank you. And I hope you'll hang out because we have a final amazing guest next. So Morgan is going to introduce her and we're going to learn a lot of fun stuff and hear from some of the people she's photographed. So Morgan, I turn it over to you. Yes, I am so excited to introduce this next guest, Amy Boyle, who is a professional photographer and two years ago kind of came up with this theory of what would happen if I photographed a woman once a week and told her story to the world? Um, and since then, in 2018, mm -hmm. she has photographed more than a hundred women. So obviously this has spanned more than just the year that she committed to. Um, and she tells their stories through the 52 Phenomenal Women Project, which also raises funds for Dress for Success. Um, and she has featured women from all over the country, ages ranging from 21 to 83. And due to the success of the project, like I said, she's continued on for at least another year, pandemic be damned. She is sharing mm -hmm. these women's stories. I am so excited to introduce you to Amy Boyle. Yay! Hi there. So happy to be here and thank you so much for highlighting I'm, I'm happy to be a tart and I hope all my phenomenal women are also very grateful to be tarts as well. Um, the project has been a labor of love for the past. This coming Wednesday will be 104 weeks consecutively with no break. And, you know, like you said, um, pandemic be damned because people keep saying yes. And that's an amazing place to be. So we have some slides that you gave us, Amy, that kind of talk yeah. about why don't we have Mark put up the first one and then you sure. can tell us all about it. So ultimately, um, like, like Morgan said, it, it started with the concept of what if we highlighted a story a week and the idea being that not just, you know, popular culture, right? Maybe our neighbor, our friend, everyone who so many women in general just don't say I am phenomenal right now. It's like somebody else is, or I was, or I will be, and all these caveats that we put on ourselves. So um, just to kind of strip that all away, get away from our LinkedIn profiles and just talk about maybe the why behind your what. And when we really get down to that essence, it's very easy to see that now, how do you say, what are you not phenomenal in? Because now you own it. So these stories, um, are complemented with my photography, but what I have done over the last hundred year, hundred years, sure, feels like it sometimes, <laughs> right? <laughs> hundred years, I'm really old, by the way. Uh, I'm Benjamin Buttoning backwards. Um, so anywho, um, for the last hundred weeks or so is to add in their narrative. So initially I'd started with more of an interview style and quickly switched to in her own words. And that phrase alone also gives so much power to the stories that we are sharing because everything that you say you own and then that ripple effect of what we do in our, in our immediate community, but now our online community to be there for each other, especially while social distance and everything else has become even more important. And on top of it, like you mentioned, we have everyone who participates has been asked to make us a donation to Dress for Success. The project itself is donated on my time, but we have raised over $7,000 for the Chicago chapter of Dress for Success. So also making sure that we going forward, we're enabling more women to have the power to take over 
their life in small bits and huge bits all at once. So. Well, I'm so excited to see. We have three of the women here that you featured. Yeah. They're also going to tell yeah. their story. Do you want to introduce them and then we'll spotlight them too so they can share a bit? Sure. Well, your world might know our chief mentor, Debbie Lilly, extraordinaire. Um, she's been a part of my life for the last few years and makes everything a perfect event, no pun intended. Um, also is partners with Safeways and Albertsons and takes everything from grocery to gorgeous. But her whole story um, for the feature was really like, where did your inspiration come from? And that was her beloved grandmother, Gigi. So Debbie, do you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. I'm in my pajamas. <laughs> I hope you guys are too. Having yeah. a very slow Sunday over here. So Debbie, will you tell us a little bit about the, sh the story that you shared um, for this photo shoot and also for this feature? I will. I will say that I love going to Amy's website on a bad day. I think we've all had lots of bad days this year during the pandemic and it's so inspiring and it really helps perk me up when I'm just struggling a little bit. So thank you, Amy, for sharing all these great stories. And I have always my whole life been in love with my grandmother, Gigi, who we just lost this year to COVID. Mm -hmm. So sharing her story with Amy mm -hmm. means even more now because it is sort of in a, a really beautiful place with all these other women and their stories. And my grandmother always made everything in my life and our family's life so beautiful. She always set a beautiful table. She loved having everyone over. She was very famous for Sunday suppers, which we're continuing in my family. Uh, going forward and I encourage everybody else to do the same. I feel like entertaining, especially in COVID, has become a lost art and in whatever little way, just like Belinda's amazing boozy brunch online, you can celebrate with people and create beautiful memories together. Well, uh, Debbie, people don't know that I wanted to have you as a guest earlier and we didn't make it happen <laughs> yet, but we're still going to have you. I can't wait to share that magic um, with everyone in the audience soon. So thank you for joining us today. <laughs> thank you. So amazing. Yeah. Amy, can you tell us about the next featured? Sure. I always say so extraordinary. I I'm sorry about that. It's phenomenal. Phenomenal. But also in parentheses, also extraordinary. <laughs> Well, I appreciate all the fantastic adjectives that go along with it, because I think there isn't just one that contains all of us. So that works for me. Um, so I don't know if Anubi was able to get on. I know she was going back and forth. I'm on. Some yep. Oh, you're on. Yeah, she is. So, How are you? Yeah. so, I mean, gosh, your story alone, what you shared with me, your love of cooking that came back from working side by side with your grandfather when you were in India, and then your love of your family with your daughters and sharing it going forward and then now taking your Indian heritage and your cooking and sharing it with the rest of the world with not one, two, but three cookbooks and a line of spices and sauces that you can find at Whole Foods. And just the person that you are is just a joy. Like I love watching your um, live chats and your cook longs because you can see the passion and as a mother of four sons myself, I know what it's like, like why we do this. So um, take it away. Tell us more. Uh, thank you. And uh, Belinda, it's so nice to meet you finally. I've heard so many amazing things about you. And Dabby, I love you so much. And it's so good to see you this way. I don't really have too much to say, except I'm not in my PJs, but I have total bedhead. So sorry, <laughs> I'm not as presentable as I'd like to be. But you know, Indian as apple pie is really all about making Indian food really accessible, but, but teaching folks that, guess what? It should be authentic and it's okay if you don't know what it is. We can meet in the middle, I can hold your hand. You don't have to feel stressed out about asking questions. And what I find really interesting in this day and age of you know the craziness out there politically is that when I go in and I do my, my most well attended events are in libraries in little tiny towns across the Midwest and these towns where you think that you have this level of um, you know non-acceptance for diversity but there's a huge embracing of diversity actually so I feel like I really want that message told I'll go to St. Charles, I go to like these little places and people that have never tried Indian want to try it, but they want 
to be able to feel comfortable and in a safe space to be able to ask their questions. And for me, I grew up outside of Philadelphia, born in India, went back to India, back and forth. My dad's from a tiny village. But back then, the most ethnic we ever got in Philly was Italian. So I was just real Italian to everybody, never, and they didn't even know what India was, and now they do. So it's progression, it's growth, it's learning, and it's okay to not know something is what I really is my platform. It's a real teaching platform. And um, I just am honored to be, you know, here today with all of you. Amy's amazing. Look at this picture she took. Uh, <laughs> she made me look good. And she made me look 10 pounds lighter. So I got to say, you are an amazing photographer. <laughs> These photos are stunning. And we cannot wait to check out your book, too. That's truly amazing. And we've got one more phenomenal woman to showcase. So Amy, tell us a little bit about who we're seeing on the screen. Yeah, this is Brittany and my... Um, Office manager Kristen, who's also on the call, we met Brittany when we went to Time Out Market to have lunch one afternoon in late February. And while we were sitting there, she was like, what are you interested in having today? And she blended up this, I can't even remember, Kristen, you might have to chime in what it was, but it was so good. And you could just tell her passion behind what she was doing. She used to have a, she used to be a flight attendant, but then she went into a bartender to go kind of service. And then when we met her at Time Out, she was getting ready for like the big like um, contest against all the bartenders there. And then of course COVID hits. So then shut down and what have you. But um, we had such an incredible time meeting with her. She's a go-getter. She loves to put together flavors and just knowing that I think her story, we said finding the happy and happy hour and Belinda, I believe, you know, all about that. Like there is happiness and community, happiness and sharing celebration, happiness and good news. And someone like Brittany and everybody here, you all get that. So there were, and then the project itself is all these stories and 101 more. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing these stories and these absolutely stunning images. Mark has been kind enough to drop all of the links to those specific stories in the chat box. So please go ahead and check those out. Follow Amy on Instagram to see more. Thank you so much, Amy, for being here today. And thank you to all of our guests and presenters for taking time out of your Sunday on a holiday weekend to join us here for virtual mm -hmm. Boozy Brunches 25th episode. <laughs> Side note, congratulations, Belinda. This is absolutely huge and monumental, and you have given us such a beautiful place to gather on Sundays. Um, and as a final reminder, please tip our beautiful presenters. We've got Venmo information in the comments, in the chat box. Um, so please take a moment to pull up your Venmo app send them a couple bucks. I know it would go a long way. Thank you. So that's the end of the programming for today. Although we are going to do a little bonus and hopefully Garrett is still here and we can make his punch because I still have a lot of room to drink. I also want to say a newbie and Debbie, I can't wait to have you guys as guests on virtual boozy brunch. We'd love to cook with you, learn to make magical spaces and events with you, Debbie. So super fun. I want to tell everybody about next week because next week is episode 26. And the theme is social, because this is how we social these days. We have two more legendary bartenders, Tom Macy and Julie Rayner, who are on the left in this image here. Julie is um, one of a mentor of mine. I know a mentor of Garrett's. She opened Flatiron Lounge in New York, which is one of the very first like craft cocktail bars in the country. Lonnie Kai, Peg U Club, Clover Club, Landa, amazing places. She also recently, I think it was this year, Garrett can correct me, maybe it was last year, she won the first Tales of the Cocktail Mentor Award, because you can't throw a stone in New York and not hit a bar where she mentored the founders of that bar and the owners. And Tom is also sort of a protege of hers and also now a business partner. So we're going to go through the perfect gin and tonic and also taste their brand new canned cocktails, which I think are the best canned cocktails on earth. And then we have Christine, who's joined us for Bruzy Bruzy Brunch before. She's a dancer. She's a rockette. Her husband, Chris, is also a dancer, a comedian, and a professional on stage. And they are choreographing our first virtual boozy brunch dance. And we're going to learn it together. And I'm going to convince all of you to do it with me on TikTok. 
So get ready for that. We're definitely going to have some movement and it's going to be so much fun. But that's all we have planned for today, except for we're going to do a little after party with Garrett's second cocktail. And I'm thrilled. And we always leave this space open because we love to hang out with you. We love to support.